Hey everyone, this is Nick Dearbertis teaching you financial modeling. Today we're going to be doing an introduction to internal randomness. This is part of our lecture series on probabilistic modeling. So we already talked about um, scenario modeling and some math, math tools to work with probability in general in our models. Now let's move to internal randomness. So internal randomness is just like the name sounds. There is something internal to the model which is random. Um, and so that means that uh, you might have something like a portfolio model um, where each of the returns on each of the assets in your portfolio uh, is random by some some measure. Um, so it's something that um, is within your model that is going to change to some other value each time that you run the model. Uh, so this is not anymore taking just a single number for some input. It's picking a random number each time. And that doesn't mean necessarily totally random. Uh, it usually means random from some kind of distribution. Um, which we'll dig into in a little bit. And that distribution can be for a discrete or a continuous variable. Uh, as we covered in the math review variable, a continuous distribution is going to be defined by a function and a curve, whereas a discrete uh, is going to be defined by a table of the probabilities. So, Here's a quick graphic which uh, visualizes internal randomness and the biggest change to the way that you work with your model relating to internal randomness. So with internal randomness, you have the same exact inputs to the model um, and you run it, but each time that you run it, you get different outputs. So that is very different from everything we've done so far, where the same inputs are always going to give the same outputs. The outputs only change when you change the inputs. That's a deterministic model. Our model is no longer deterministic here. We keep running with the same inputs, and we get different outputs every time. Uh, so that's usually what you're going for when you're building internal randomness model but it's also something you have to carefully consider and be cautious of if you're thinking about building an internal randomness model because this concept does make it quite a bit more difficult to understand whether your model is working appropriately, uh, especially if you're, you're going and making some changes to an existing model. You now get a different result than you did before, substantially. Is that difference just due to the randomness, or is it due to a mistake that you made in your change? And it can be difficult to determine that. And there, there are ways uh, to be able to get towards more consistent results out of an internal randomness model, basically by running it a bunch of times and aggregating the output. And we'll get into all of that within the examples. But it is uh, something to carefully consider that your model is going to become more complex just on the nature of you're not going to know necessarily what outputs to expect from your model. It's going to be random within some kind of range. So considering those kinds of drawbacks uh, with internal randomness, you really only want to use this technique when this randomness is very important and core within your model. Um, there are other ways you can add this kind of randomness to your model. Uh, Monte Carlo simulation, which will be our next main topic of exploring the parameter space, is uh, basically the external counterpart to internal randomness. Uh, where internal randomness, you're drawing inputs from some kind of distribution within the model. Monte Carlo simulation, you take a deterministic model and you extend it by drawing random values for the inputs. Uh, so they can both accomplish a lot of the same goals, 
but going with Monte Carlo simulation means that your original core model is still deterministic, and so it's still easy to evaluate and check and understand. Um, and so for most situations, uh, I would recommend going towards Monte Carlo simulation, but if it's really important for your model, then internal randomness can make sense. Um, so a couple examples there. Um, for the retirement model, um, an external uh, method makes sense to vary the investment return in the model uh, because we've already built out the core model. It's already deterministic. Um, and so it's much easier to extend it by adding Monte Carlo simulation than to go and kind of rebuild it by using internal randomness. Um, and that, that brings up another point, which is generally... If you want to go with internal randomness, you should think about this before you build the model and build it in as you create the model. It's typically more difficult to add internal randomness to an existing model than it is to build it uh, from scratch the first time. Um, but as I mentioned, a good example where you might want to use internal randomness is in a portfolio model because you're uh, you know, you can never know what to expect on investment returns of individual assets. They may as well be random um, for modeling purposes. And so building that randomness right into the model, um, that means you'll be able to get, um, you know, different statistics relating to the variation in the portfolio returns uh, within the core model. So... Um, when you use internal randomness, you can think of internal randomness versus Monte Carlo simulation uh, in a lot of the same ways as ex internal versus external sensitivity analysis. Um, when we build it internally to the model, the model itself becomes more complex. The core model is more complicated than it was before, but running the model is just as easy as it was before. Whereas when we add it externally, uh, then it becomes more complicated to run the model. We might have to run the model multiple times, associate the inputs with the outputs, aggregate that in some way. Um, but the core model itself remains just as simple. And so it's just as easy to make changes on the core model going forward. Um, and as I've highlighted, uh, while this is typically the goal of internal randomness, it's also the drawback, which is that your model is not deterministic. You run it multiple times with the same inputs, you're going to get multiple different outputs. And then looking at how we would implement internal randomness with continuous variables. Uh, so again, whether it's discrete or continuous, you're going to be drawing that uh, value from a distribution. Just here with continuous, that distribution is defined by a function or a curve. Um, so then for whatever input you're thinking about, you need to determine which distribution makes the most sense for your input. Uh, and if you're not sure, it will be the right choice in most of the cases for your inputs, just use the normal distribution. Um, as we discussed, in the math review, the central limit theorem makes it such that most of the things we observe are going to be normally distributed. Um, but it is important that you pick an appropriate mean and standard deviation for your normal distribution. Uh, it can be very different uh, values coming out as a result from two normal distributions if they have different means or standard deviations. So when thinking about how should I pick the mean and standard deviation or the mean, uh, if you have historical data, then use that historical data to take an average of the historical and use that as your estimate for the, the mean of the normal distribution. Um, if you don't have any historical data, then just think of what a reasonable, normal, typical kind of value for this input would be. As far as the standard deviation, the way that you can think about it 
is in terms of how likely is it for this input to be that far from the mean. So you want to think about it in terms of multiples of the standard deviation, one, two, three, four times the standard deviation. Uh, so one times the standard deviation in either direction from the mean should be a common deviation. So let's uh, put an example that, to this to make it a little more concrete. If you're thinking about an investment return, say just an overall market return, uh, you might say 7% is a reasonable average. Just based on historical data, 7% is a fairly reasonable estimate of an overall market return. Then we need to determine the standard deviation. Uh, let's maybe pick uh, 3% as an initial value to think about for the standard deviation. And let's go through this um, logic of thinking about multiples of the standard deviation and how they relate. So one times the standard deviation difference should be a common occurrence. So that means that take that 7%, go up, up to 10%, down to 4%, that 10 to 4% range should be common for uh, the investment rate for that to be a valid standard deviation, which four to ten percent definitely common kinds of market returns. So we're already sounding reasonable. Two times the standard deviation in either direction should not happen often. It should be relatively rare, but um, still happens. Uh, you know, a, a substantial portion of the time. Uh, so that would be. With 7% mean, 3% standard deviation, now 2 times the standard deviation is 6%. So that would be going down to 1% and up to 13%. Uh, that should be a range of uh, the investment uh, return falls in here most of the time. Sometimes it'll go outside of that, which 1% to 11%, that sounds reasonable. 3 times the standard deviation should be rare. So that's not to say it won't happen, it's just uh, very uncommon. So um, then we're looking at 9% in either direction of that 7% mean, so that's negative two uh, up until 16%. Um, so that seems fairly appropriate. We might be a little bit small on the standard deviation because certainly returns go lower than negative two with a decent uh, degree of frequency. So based on that, we might want to increase uh, the standard deviation, maybe 4% is going to be more appropriate. And then we're looking at four times three, 12% down from the 7%, uh, so that's down to negative 5%. Uh, so that seems like a more reasonable range um, for an annual market return. And then a, a four times standard deviation change should be very, very rare, um, almost never occur. Um, and so that is maybe where um, this gets a little bit weird with investment returns. Uh, typically, um, we use like a, a log normal distribution or something with heavier tails than a normal distribution uh, for investment returns because we do have those extreme events like, you know, big recessions, all of a sudden negative 40% return on the market. Uh, hopefully it recovers within the year, but you do have these very negative uh, market returns occasionally and more than uh, you would expect from a normal distribution. So, uh, you know, if you really want to be more accurate, you should probably pick a different distribution than normal for investment returns specifically. Uh, but just thinking about the normal distribution and trying to get something that's going to be pretty close most of the time, um, that uh, example we just talked through uh, will give you a, a good way to think about it. And for most inputs, the normal distribution is going to be the right choice. And so that's the kind of thinking that you would want to do to pick your standard deviation. So that's the basic introduction to internal randomness. We're going to come back next time to implement it in Excel. So thanks for listening and see you next time.